Everyone, hope you're doing well. Thank you. First of all, how are you? And second of all, I thought we could take a break from the transfer rumours today. I like the transfer rumours, don't get me wrong. But there was a little bit of Kutinsky stuff going on last week, which we'll get on to. But first of all, you good? I'm very, very well. Already itching for some for some football. So only 10 more days to go and the Euros will be here. I had a little watch of England last night. Felt a bit of a... A bit sad for Bowen last night. He seemed that he didn't get much of rubber the green. Uh, I felt like his shot that was deflected by um, his own player was a bit disappointing. And yeah, he just, he, he was, he found it hard to get into the game. And then when he did, a couple of stray passes and so on. So mm, I'm, I think it's going to be very difficult for him to get into that team now. But I'd have a lot more invested interest if he does get on that plane. Yeah, I thought, I thought Consa was a bad right back for him. Wasn't mm. really there wasn't much chemistry going on between them. There wasn't much understanding. I thought Consa was too close to Bowen a lot of the time. And when he did get the ball, there wasn't any room for him to go and attack players because of where he received it. Which is that's the way Consa plays at Aston Villa. He'll go down the right, and Diaby or Bailey will come inside a little bit, whereas Bowen wasn't really able to do that. So I thought there was a little bit of a, a battle of playing styles between Bowen and Consa, which resulted in Bowen struggling a little bit. I thought he was good in the second half, though. Uh, whether he gets on the plane or not, we'll have to wait and see. There's too many options out on that right wing with Saka and Palmer can play there as well. So I think that's his biggest issue. But anyway, we're not here to discuss them. We'll, we'll cover that later on, closer to the Euros. We'll have a little Euro chat. Uh, Scotland won, just out of, just, just in case hey. anyone's interested in Scotland won as well. We were playing Gibraltar, but you know, beggars can't be choosers. Che Adams on the score sheet. Uh, right, let's talk about Kutinski first of all. Now, we've always suspected this, that Kutinski has no interest in taking over West Ham, but he confirmed it finally. We've always had talk from his advisors, his trusted people that he has on the board at West Ham and in various companies that he's got his fingers in. Um, but now we have, we've heard it from himself now. Um, he did an interview last week and he was asked about West Ham and he basically said that we, as in all of them, the group, have no interest in becoming sole owners of, of, of the club. However, they were interested in potentially picking up more shares if possible what did you make of this i say news it's not really news because we've always suspected it frankly but maybe confirmation i think is perhaps the right term yeah i think a lot of people it's wishful thinking isn't it i think people just want anyone to be able to come in and, and take over west ham and he come in big investor lots of money i actually think it's done us a real favor that he's not interested in taking over the whole club um just from a perspective of i don't think he would be that hands-on i don't think he'd be that involved i think he'd be very distant and then it all depends on who they appoint to sort of run it and so on and and i just think it would have been a recipe for disaster i don't think he would have been as invested and as involved in the club as what we need an owner to come in and be um so i i think it's okay i think that that's fine i think he's still a good man to have on the board in terms of his wealth is is vast um it's an interesting one isn't it because similar with a moy situation it was almost anyone would do anyone else and we seem to have that same opinion with the board just anyone else but look at what's happened to Everton over the last 48 hours and the news that's coming out from their camp um, with 777 investments is is really going to put them into some really awkward uh, and that they're having to appoint people pretty drastically to try and come in and make sure that that situation isn't going to put them into any major financial difficulty so one thing I think we've got at the moment with the Sullivan and Kratinsky balance is I don't think we're ever going to be in any financial hardship which is a great place to be are they going to plow loads of money in and invest everything into the club but no they're not going to do that I think they're both sitting there waiting for their big pay out when the day comes that West Ham is sold um, but I don't think it was ever going to be them and I'm actually honestly quite glad that it's not I don't think either of them are the right people to to take West Ham forward yeah I completely agree with every word of that I've never been anyone but Moyes and I've probably been more anyone but Sullivan than anyone but Moyes if that makes sense my my yeah. lack of trust in Sullivan is probably greater than my lack of trust in David Moyes but it's never got to the point where it's like just anyone will do because I don't trust him 
but I trust him to look after his investment in West Ham, if that makes sense, like what you were alluding to, in yeah. the sense that we will we'll be okay because there's a lot at stake here. And in terms of Kutinsky, it was just confirmation of what we knew, which is this is an investment for him. I think if he was ever, just to play hypothetical here, if he was ever to take full ownership of West Ham, I don't think you'd see him running the club. I think he'd put people that he trusted in place to be the chairman and the CEO of the club. And he would just he would just be the owner of the club, but everybody else would run it on his behalf, which I'd be okay with. I don't have an issue with that. I've always said that about Sullivan. If you don't know how to, to run the football club, that's okay. But get yourself out of the way and put people in there that can do it. And I guess he's taken a step forward in employing Tim Stide in business and okay, transfer wise, I'm mean, maybe not the as Real life football manager perhaps isn't for me, so I'll get this guy in and let him do it. And I, I don't have an issue with football owners doing that, taking the the the, the back seat and letting somebody else take control of it. I, I've got no problem with it. In terms of the Kutinski thing, like we said, no surprise. The one thing I do, I don't get, Frankie, is he said he's open to more shares. Right? He alluded that he'd may, maybe be room for a bit more investment. However, we know that the gold shares or some of the gold shares, 10% are, is up for sale. It's, all, it's out there on the market. But prior to going up for sale, it would be offered to current shareholders of the club to obtain them. So he's obviously been offered these shares and refused them. But yet he's saying that he'd be open to picking more up in the future. So it just didn't really add up for me. Now, both could be true, which is he perhaps didn't want them at that valuation or at that time he didn't want them. Maybe he doesn't want them today and he's talked about in the future he'd be open to it. But I just thought, I just felt like maybe not quite a, a gotcha moment, but more of one of those, uh, as I say, hang on a minute, this, this ain't, the maths ain't mathing right now on what he's sta stating. Yeah, I think there, there's many right reasons why that could be. I think part of it could be maybe there were too many shares, the volume, and they might not want to been a they didn't want to break them up. They may have felt that offering it at the package that it's at was more attractive than diluting it down and splitting it up as as you know the the people who are in control of of those shares. And he may have just turned around and thought, actually, that extra volume, I don't want that. He might want you know, another couple of percent, you might want X, Y, and Z, but he, he doesn't want that much. So I think that could make sense. Like you said, it could be the valuation that was on them at the time. It could be that. Um, there could be many, many factors as to why he didn't decide to take those. Um, I, and we don't really know, do we? It, maybe it was the club didn't want him to have, or, or whoever it is that owns them. Sullivan might have turned around and said, well, actually, I don't want him to have those as well as what he's already got, because that is going to make me, uh, you know, a little bit more diluted. So it's, there's many reasons why it may not have quite worked out. Um, but like I say, I, I don't necessarily want him. And you said about you, you don't mind somebody being distant i think it, it's all fine uh, as and but i think there's a real place where we have directors of football now i think there really needs to be somebody appointed that is almost a club history club heritage person which newcastle when they had their takeover i can't remember the lady's name now I'm but she was yes yeah, so she was incredibly close to the fans they actually nailed that process the, the saudi team and whoever else you know the guy who actually owns that isn't anywhere near the day-to-day -day running of that football club but what they understood was for something that is almost a little bit frowned upon this outside foreign investment that's coming in from a place that is continuously picking up a lot of british sport at the moment and stuff like that they almost knew that what we've got to do is put somebody in there who's going to be incredibly close to the fans and really get, you know, give them a forum almost of what do you want as a fan base? What songs do you want played before the game? What banners do you want? What, how would your match day experience look? And I think that was a big part of Newcastle's fairly quick success it didn't take them too long to start to move forward as a football club because everyone was on board yeah okay you could look at it that you know they was always going to have a renewed energy once they got rid of ashley because they'd waited so long for it and i think we'll have a renewed energy when our day comes that our current owners are not involved in the football club anymore but you could just see how close she was with the fans you could see she listened she gave their fans every opportunity to communicate what they wanted as a football club. And I 
I don't know. Maybe Kretinsky would do something like that. But I think if you look at his other investments and you look at the other football clubs involved in, I don't see that. So if I don't see that there, why would he do it with West Ham? So I do want someone and I would prefer somebody to come in who potentially has that mentality. And and, and somebody said it really good on, I can't remember what West Ham channel what it, what it was, was on the other day. We don't necessarily want someone to come in and make us a, a top four club every season, winning things. I, mate, I watched that Real Madrid stadium where they done the beanback for the Champions League final. Mate, they score the second goal in a Champions League final and they, yeah, well done. Like, it was like, I would never want to be that club that has so much success that when it happens, it don't really mean anything. I think that's yeah. not what I see. Yes, I'd love to win stuff. I'd love it if West Ham won something once every four to five years and, you know, we were picking up bits here and there. That that would mean more. Um, so, you know, the person who comes in for me at the moment and the person who I want involved in West Ham is just someone who will try and listen to what we want as fans again. Um, and that's my focus, not necessarily massive financial investment, not over and above what we've got, but just someone who who cares. From investment to incentive, Sean Weston did an update um, at the end of last week off the back of this, stating that Callum Brady had been offered a seven-figure sum, a bonus, if she was able to bring in new investment to the club. And she'd had a trip to the Middle East, which has failed to yield any results as yet. But it sounds like the club are trying to entice the big spenders to pick up at least a portion of the club. Um but she's failed to do so so far. But there was a, a trip there from Kyan Brady and a big hefty check on offer to go on top of her big hefty wages at the minute. What did you make of this news? It goes, the news, the more interesting part of it is that I think we've been touted around for a while now. Yeah. And she has been incentivized with that. What worries me about that whole thing is if it's as easy as what it appears, i.e. Kretinsky comes in, Sullivan's waiting for ownership of the stadium. We all think that's the reason. I think if you ask anyone, when will Sullivan exit? Everyone thinks it's if he finally gains full control of the London stadium and some of the land, and then it becomes a huge, it would add value to the club exponentially. It would be huge. So we all think that that's the reason why I would exit. And we all think that's why Kretinsky put his money in is because he would also be rewarded as part of that as a shareholder. Well, these other people who are looking at it don't quite see it as easy as that. And if it was, everyone would be chomping at the bit to take some of those shares now. If they felt in a couple of years time that they was going to get a huge return on that that investment which would be small for them large in terms of what we would see the, the financial value at but you know small for them um if it was as easy as that and and there was clear roadmap to the ownership of the stadium then i think they'd have people chucking themselves in the hat and saying yes i want part of that the fact nobody from outside believes that that's going to be the case almost says to me that maybe the stadium isn't anywhere near being an option for West Ham. And if it's not, then that whole thinking that Sullivan may be on his way out at some point, maybe isn't as close as maybe some of us think. Yeah, I've never been convinced Sullivan will disappear. I've always thought maybe once the embarrassment clause was gone, which is, has been gone for a couple of seasons now, where Sullivan and Gold at the time would have to give up some of their profits to the LLDC and part of the, the lease. Well, that 10-year thing's gone now, ended last year, 2023 ended. So that's done. And he's still here. And Jack Sullivan did a podcast last week. And I saw it. He was basically like, my dad just loves working. And we all know people like that, I would argue. You're a bit like that, where you just love working and it's a bit like well what would he do if he was to sell at West Ham and I think our our initial reaction would probably be well you just go buy another club he'll, he'll probably just go buy maybe a lower league club one that Jack can then run at some point when he's older and, and David Sullivan is no longer here or he passes away um but why would he do that why would he not just remain at West Ham and then pass West Ham on to Jack and say, and, and of Davies' other sons, they said, there you go, they, you, you've got a Pender League club rather than a, a League One club to some extent. I'm not ever convinced that A, Sullivan will go, but B, 
It's the stadium's interesting because obviously there's a bit of movement now with the staff in charge of the LLDC, Lynn Garner's due to step down. So there's some changes happening there, which could maybe lead to something for West Ham. But then when you see the costs associated with everything, it's just, it's some silly for the club to take the stadium on. And I know people say, oh, the new owners are coming and redevelop the ground. I'm yet to be convinced they will because it would be a, an incredibly expensive project. And we're already filling up the stadium. So financially, what would they get back from the stadium? Not much more than what they currently are getting back, actually. There's not much return on that investment because we're selling out every week, not, not necessarily filling it up every week, but the tickets are sold. The, uh, Sean did a tweet last night which says the re renewal rates are 91.5%, which is possibly the lowest it's been since we moved to the London Stadium. But it's still 91.5% of people renewing despite what has been perceived as a poor season. And I know Lopetegui's come in, but I wouldn't say it's... Uh, I think that was all financial, you. mate. All financial. Yeah. Especially, yeah. so I tried to, to get my boy a season ticket and they wouldn't have concessions. They're already yeah, in the point where they're yeah. saying no yeah. concessions. To go from what effectively would have been a £99 child's ticket to a £400 ticket for you know a six or seven-year-old, is, is especially in the times that we're in, the financial commitment's too too big for some people. Yeah, yeah I've got um, tomorrow's video is about the season tickets because I've mentioned it before, but I did it back in April when they sort of, the season ticket information came out saying, oh, you can renew now. Here's your prices for next year. Hang on a minute. There's stuff missing here and there's stuff changed. I'm not happy about But it's sort of getting more and more publicity. And like I said, Wolves at the minute. If you've got five minutes tonight, just Google Wolves season tickets. It's kicking off at the mall in you right now between Wolves fans. And genuinely, the chief executives of the club are now getting involved and almost arguing with the fans. And they saying, well, go away then. If you don't like it, mm. bugger off. And you think our owners don't care. It's, it's worse at Wolves. But I, I just think this is a warning. This is what we've got to come. It's bad at the minute. It's only going to get worse if we accept it. But when you look at the London Stadium as well, though, We've been, they've been trying to get naming rights for that stadium since we moved in. They've not got one. I just sometimes think maybe the interest isn't there. And then you mm. look at gold shares. They've been up for sale for quite some time now, the 10%. And there's not a sniff. There was reports like a month ago saying that there's hardly any interest whatsoever in them shares. Now, why those reasons might be are, are varied. It could be they're too expensive, 10% is not enough for some people, or it's too much for others etc there's a whole host of reasons that can be attached to that but i just think that for whatever reason there's not loads of interest in acquiring west ham and i do just wonder if it's just the overall valuation that we are worth a lot of money as a football club and we're possibly one of the clubs that are hard to value i've seen the american guy the american financial expert saying that the top the big six in Premier league are worth this much then there's three other clubs that are unique and they're worth anything between and he said something like 700 million to 2.4 billion i mean financial expert with a, a gap of 1.7 billion in his valuation isn't that impressive to me but anyway he was basically saying that west ham villa and there was another might be everton was they're unique in the sense that they've got the heritage and they've been in the Premier league for so long it's almost like the revenue is almost guaranteed at this point, and that makes you very, worth a lot of money. And I just think maybe that that's what's putting people off, really, and that Sullivan might be here to stay, and Kutinski might be here to stay without getting involved too much. And Brady, well, she's trying to find someone to get involved and not really achieving much at the minute. But not just her. Um, gold can't sell the shares either. So, yeah, maybe not mm. too much change on the horizon, Frankie. I don't think so. But again, like we say, I, I, I know... We haven't, um, we're not too fond of them, uh, and I'm certainly not their biggest fan, and so on. I think a lot of people are happier at the moment because obviously the journey we've been on the past couple of seasons sort of makes it a, a little bit easier to, to suffer and swallow. This season, back to Saturday football, I think people will really enjoy that again as well. New manager coming in. I think it, it will be OK for, for the next couple of years. Uh, I don't think there'll be any, I don't, I don't think there'll be too much bald animosity in there. Um, you know, I, I think it's, yeah... <laughs> When I look at what's happened to Everton today, you just never know, dear. You? you know, it's you, you see what some of these outside 
Um, and looking at what how Chelsea has you know spent all that money and are now scrimping and the situation they're in and everything else, you just don't know. Uh, and sometimes. Better at the devil, moment, you know. yeah, better. That, that's exactly what, what what went through my head. And at the moment, I'm not too focused on that, to be honest with you. Next season is all about this new manager letting um, our man go out there, Stighton, and and try and build something for us to enjoy and get that entertainment level back to going over to football again. And maybe, uh, you know, that isn't too prominent in people's thoughts at the moment. Look. You know, in the future, would I like it to be the point where, like I said, someone comes in and focuses a bit on West Ham again, focuses on our history again, makes it feel a little bit more like West Ham again, to be honest, and and just starts to bring the club closer to the fans. Like I said to you a couple of times, I think we're so, I've never felt so distant from my football club in terms of how close you can get, how close you can get to players, how close you can get to, you know, things that are going on and whatever else. And, and it would be nice to feel like they're listening to us again. Um, and I think that would really help. And one thing, that I see mate I went to Wembley for those playoff finals in the lower divisions Wembley's got safe standing now you know that's in a national stadium there's no excuse now not to have safe standing that would massively improve the atmosphere at the London Stadium it would be brilliant to get that in and if they're being funny about it and they don't want it around the away fans because they're concerned we'll put it at the other end of the stadium then um but there's no excuse not to have that now i think even just something small like that that the board could go and do tomorrow would just give everybody a a, a real big a real big lift so yeah it's um forget about the uh, takeover at the moment i think mate i think it's all on the back burner i don't think there's any um changes on the horizon as you said i think we're a long way from that so let's uh, concentrate on the football yeah, I completely agree with you. You just said in regards to them listening, there's more evidence that they don't rather than they do. And like I said, the season tickets are a big part of that. Removing concessions, moving where the concessions sit. And it just doesn't sit well with me, but we'll cover it tomorrow. Frankie, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure as always. No and you might have some transfer rumours next week, though. You got off with it this week. I'm all right week. with that. We might have a signing, though. We might actually have, not we just rumours, we might actually have a Brazilian at the club um, to, to to discuss. And to, so you've got a week to do some research. But, uh, Frankie, I'll catch up with you next week. If you guys at home have enjoyed it, please do drop a like, comment by clicking thumbs up. Subscribe to you around here. Myself and Frankie, see you next week. Mm-hmm.